Welcome to Bloomberg Green. Um, we've had, as I'm sure many of us, uh, some scheduling issues and Marie's not been able to make it. Uh, but we have with us uh, Ishraq Osman, who's the fundraising director for Me and Youth. Um, and I'm just going to start with uh, asking uh, each of our panelists the story of how they came to doing what they do. Um, I had the pleasure of being able to put together a, a book of edited essays of 60 activists from 60 different countries uh, two years ago. And the most fascinating thing I found was they had such different stories, life stories, to come to the point that they have. Uh, so Isha, can I start with you? What is it that brought you to working on climate issues? Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's such a pleasure to be in front of such a crowd. Uh, everyone willing to help in our green um, journeys and our climate journeys that we come with our own identities. So I come from Sudan, but I am uh, based in the UAE. And uh, growing up outside Sudan and as a diaspora community generally, I really felt this responsibility uh, towards what I can provide back home. And my climate journey really started with my uh, bachelor's in environmental sciences. Um, I was very much aware of the situation in Sudan with regards to the flood crisis. And I wanted to know how much are people within the Sudanese context also trying to uh, provide for themselves and how are they, you know, uh, breaking barriers towards what the crisis that they're facing. Um, and then just like three months ago, I got the chance to go to the Greenpeace Climate Justice Camp. I found a great mix of beautiful youth-led initiatives, different people, climate activists that had this ambition in them to really bring about the justice that we call for. And that's when we got this idea where we saw that there is a reason why we are in this stagnant stage and it's because we're not getting any accessibility to the right funding, to the right resources that will help us reach our potential. And that's where we decided you know, if no one's gonna stand up for us, we'll stand up for ourselves. We will try to change the philanthropic pathway that is so inaccessible to many of us and that will give us the potential to really reach and help our communities. And so, what, what are some of the first things that you want to do if you're able to get the funds that you are trying to raise now? So the first thing is that we are targeting people that come from MAPA, which are most affected areas. Uh, these are the same people that are at the front lines of the climate crisis. They're the ones facing the brunt of climate crisis. They're the ones that require these funds to come in and get translated into the resources they require, be it capacity building, be it actual tangible facilities that they need in their community. And many times in the African context, we see that they are uh, stripped away from their connection with, let's say, their government or the space that they're in. Um, and because of that, they're deprived from such resources. So we're really trying to see how we can involve them in a better space, in a space that will give them this accessibility. Right. Now, EL, uh, we are in a country where protests are nigh impossible, and yet COP meetings, which are essentially synonymous with protests, is happening here. What has it been like for you to be able to make it to Sharm el Sheikh? So it's been quite complicated. Um, the first thing you need to solve if you want to participate in a conference like this to enter the Blue Zone is accreditation. And getting accreditation for youth can be quite difficult. I have many friends who were able to get the funding from different parts of around the world and weren't able to make it here because they couldn't get the credentials. Um, luckily, in my government this year, um, from Argentina, it's been much easier than in other instances. And they gave us badges as part of a party overflow. Um, credentials and so we were able to make it like that and once you solve the credentials comes uh, the real complicated part which is gathering the funding especially if you're from the global south and you're young less than 1% of uh, climate funding from grants from foundations and different initiatives go to youth-led initiatives and most of that is concentrated in the US so if you're from Argentina like me it can be quite a hassle to gather the funding to be able to come here. I had to basically get small pots of gold from different persons and one people who were able to buy the fights and another who were able to help with the housing. And specifically housing here, there you can see a, a very concrete way 
of how unequal the um, climate world is in terms of the differences between the global north and the global south. I'm staying in the Tulip Inn, which is the hotel that is subsidized by the Egyptian government. We arrived there and many of the places were overbooked, so people were literally being rejected at their, there when they arrived after having spent thousands of dollars and lots of times and months of planning to be able to get here. And of course, um, we're all from the global south in that hotel, the ones that are, are staying there. And so accessibility really for the financing and yeah. the credentials can be quite difficult at times. And how has it been the first few days uh, in terms of being able to protest? They, you know, we've seen sporadic uh, photos of some protests being allowed inside the blue zone. Uh, but compare your experience back in COP26 to what it is now in COP27 and how do you feel the difference beyond the logistical challenges of getting here? So in COP26, I remember there being interventions and direct actions constantly, multiple times a day. And then, of course, a huge youth strike on Friday and an even bigger intersectional uh, coalition-led strike on Saturday, which in total mobilized between both, maybe like 300, 400,000 people. This time, there probably won't be any mobilization, or any strike outside. If it is, it will be very small. I haven't seen even one uh, direct action or protest inside the, the venue. I think I saw one outside. But this is also one of the contradictions that I've seen at COP in the sense of the things that we're usually protesting for is money for adaptation, money for loss and damages instead, instead of reparations. And the Egyptian government, being part of Africa, being one of the countries that is suffering climate violence firsthand, has been pushing really hard for adaptation and loss and damages to be in the negotiating tables. And so there's that contradiction in the sense of there's no protests and suddenly there's being advances in adaption and loss and damages. So that's been quite confusing, to, to be honest. And Kazi, now you started off as an activist, but very quickly through your experience in Burundi, you moved on to business as a solution. Uh, could you just give us a, a, a run through of how you came to climate and what is it that you are uh, deploying as solutions now? Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I started as a climate activist as uh, I got the opportunity to be uh, a student in environmental sciences at university. Uh, at that time, I realized how we are facing an alarming rate of, rate of deforestation uh, where we were losing about between 5,000 and 7,000 hectares of forest cover in our country per year. So it was an alarming rate of deforestation. We started with my uh, student, student mate. We organized some conferences, some campaigns in uh, my community. But uh, the question was, uh, yes, you told, you told us about we, we, we should change what we use in cooking, but where is the alternative? And I decided at that time that my activism should be accompanied by concrete actions. And then I started, I, I founded Kaze Green Economy, which is a clean cooking company. Uh, it was in 2017. Uh, I started with uh, two USD, two USD, US dollar, two, uh, just for research and uh, some documentation, how I can find an alternative. And then uh, in 2018, I, I, I realized to raise uh, 30 USD, and then I conceived the prototype. Wow. Yeah. With just with 30, 30 yes. dollars. And after five months, I was uh, with my team uh, producing 40 kg eco-friendly charcoal produced from agriculture waste. Waste. And so then, rather than using wood yeah. from forests, which was the problem. Yes, to replace the use of wood as the main source of energy. And then we keep working, working, uh, seeing how we can promote that, uh, th those product to be alternative. And then we also uh, continued to raise awareness in our community. And then in 2020, uh, we come up with an industrial, uh, industrial production of uh, 30 ton matrix uh, of eco-friendly charcoal. Right. And uh, now, it's a, it, it became a, a big company where we are producing 
uh, those charcoal and providing them in our community. Uh, more than 80,000 households are using our product. Wow. Uh, it's, it's like 10% uh, of the market. The market is still huge, but we are proud to contribute at least 10%. It's not uh, too small because we are saving uh, about 50 hectares per month that were lost uh, beca uh, about, uh, because of the use of wood as the main source of energy. And the company has created more than 60 employees. Right. Uh, and that, that, that is what we decide we, we should do uh, activism, but also uh, following them with concrete actions. Yeah. yeah. And you told me that access to electricity in Burundi is mm -hmm. still 7%, which is only 7% of the population has access to electricity. Yeah, so yeah, energy yeah. access has been uh, uh, an issue that we've talked about here at COP quite a bit. You know, the numbers are something like half of uh, all, uh, uh, half of the population in Africa doesn't have access to electricity. Burundi is, a, you know, uh, an extreme case where it's, what is it that you have to uh, when you go out and you talk about climate change in those circumstances, what kind of reactions do you get from community? Yeah, uh, it's very uh, complicated about uh, universal access on energy in our country. As you said, uh, just 7% of the population has access on electricity, and uh, that is also uh, what pushed us also to invest in uh, solar electrification, especially in a remote area to see what we can bring as a change in our community. Uh, we did some campaigns in the rural area, uh, but we find those people, they don't know uh, really about climate change. But there are other really issues they are facing in, that, in their daily life. So we decide let's uh, raising awareness in that community, but also bring some concrete solutions. Yeah. People should cook with uh, some clean cooking energy solutions. P people should have access on electricity because those are some uh, pillars to Basic development. Needs, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, indoor cooking, which is very common, kills uh, four and a half million people uh, annually. Uh, and that's just because of all the fumes that are generated from burning inefficiently uh, the wood. So, Wood burning is still a solution, but clean cooking allows for, for those particulate uh, matter pollution to not be affected and, and thus uh, help with health, not just access to energy. Um, now, Ishak, you, it's, you know, we're coming to end of the first working week. It's been four or five days. Do you think the topics that you had in mind are being discussed and are being given the platform that they deserve? So obviously loss and damage was one of the most important points that needed to be. I mean, if COP didn't bring that up, then we would have been just super disappointed. And I mean, every year we hear about COP, okay, and we, and we want to have expectations, but at the same time, it's like, we want to ensure that we are staying realistic regarding the situation and that really it's us that has to fend for ourselves, really. Um, so I am kind of happy to hear that. Um, I don't know if I should celebrate it yet. Uh, today I was attending this event with uh, where the Climate um, Resilience Fund, Climate Justice Resilience Funds were uh, talking and they were also speaking about how we don't even have philanthropy for a loss and damage. So maybe we want to ensure that. So maybe COP27 did bring that kind of dialogue into our discourse. And, um, and what's missing that you would like more conversations on? Transparency how much we can actually see that this is happening. Um, they were also speaking in the climate finance meeting today where everyone's disappointed with the fact that there's no executive summary for this situation and the climate financing issue. And we need to know how is that funding going to take place? We need to know how is it going to reach the people that require it the most? And at the same time, that they're not gonna be facing a lot of barriers or obstacles on the way. And this is where you know, our grassroots movements need to be at the front of this dialogue. Uh, they're the ones that should be leading this because it's them that we want to fund yeah. in the end of the day. And Eel, we talked about how coming here uh, and, and the difficulties of, of getting here, but you've now been running the organization for three years. What are the main challenges for you to be able to overcome 
uh, over the last three years to try and, and build a movement and, and bring more people along? I guess the main problem you have um, when you're movement building and organizing in youth organizations, it's in one hand that for many of us, this was our first experience in participating in uh, an organization, in collective organizing, in, in politics, in advocacy, in environmentalism. And so, of course, there's a big learning curve there. It's very hard to transform that initial uh, outburst of energy into structure, into concrete programs. Now, how can we transform that advocacy and protest into solutions and concrete actions, like he was saying before? Um, so that's been one of the main problems. And then, uh, when you are part of a collective organization, one of the most difficult parts is uh, dealing with egos, basically. That I think that's someone that anyone that's part of a company or an NGO or foundation or, or a political party uh, knows very well. People who participate uh, many times in, in politics and organizations, lots of us have big egos, and we have to deal with that and work with that constantly and develop the solutions and the ways to work with each other and prioritize the collective and our objectives and uh, not become freelance activists. That's something that happens a lot, you know? People who call themselves activists who don't participate in any organization and are just flying around from conference to conference, and I just don't think that's the way you transform thing. And one last thing that has been one of the main issues um, is funding, basically. It's ridiculous how little funding comes to youth organizations, even more ridiculous how little of it comes to organizations in the global south. And it doesn't even make sense from the founder's perspective, because if founders want to get funders, sorry, want to get the most amount of bang for their buck, they want to be able to present, see how much uh, good is being done with their money, well then come to Argentina where Sadly, our currency is so devaluated that with very little money, you can have such a big impact in terms of concrete climate action and fund people who are organizing in the front lines and transforming their economies and their local communities and their educational system. So those, I guess, are yeah. three of the biggest problems that we've faced. And Kasi, in, in, if we stick to funding, you, there are some solutions you've found where for running a business, you may need money but you also need employees and you need, you're also running campaigns alongside. How are you getting access to the money that you need both to run the business and to be able to run uh, climate campaigns? Yeah, uh, getting access uh, on finance, it, it, it's not easy uh, as young people. Uh, for example, in our countries, Burundi or in East Africa in general, there are kind of guarantees they we ask you when you are going to, ask, uh, to like, request uh, some loans and uh, then it, it, it become difficult. Uh, but for me, uh, I try to, to be a hustler as an entrepreneur and then uh, raise found in, my, in people around me, my family, my friends who can uh, really understand what I'm doing. But uh, sometimes it's very hard as we have some innovative product that are coming as new product on the market. Uh, different people uh, really don't know about this product and then it become difficult. But uh, when, we, when the government uh, trying to, to understand what we are doing, uh, that is it, it's a, a solution, a sustainable solution. They gave us some facilitation, they changed like policies, they uh, beginning to increase our visibility and then people uh, begin to buy our product and then some get some contract from some boarding school, some camps and some uh, restaurant. And then uh, for campaigns and activists, we as, as activists, I, I, uh, I decide I have to give back to my community. Sometime we, we, we take some monies uh, and then we go for campaigns as we know. If people uh, are aware of the importance of using those eco-friendly product, our business we uh, will be sustainable, but also we will achieving our objective, our sustainable development goals. And then, so we 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 decided to keep 
uh, investing in the business, but also giving back to the community. Right. And uh, I can give uh, an example, like uh, in June, we, 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 we managed to organize a training for 100 young people, students from uh, secondary school, and also we give training to uh, 180 groups of women, and so we give trainings about this product, climate education, and then uh, those, all, all those groups, all those young people, they, they go like uh, give an, another uh, sensitization in their community. Right. So we keep doing both business and also activism. Right. Yeah. Now talking of governments, um, how has it been, you said uh, you got access to the Blue Zone through the Argentinian government delegation, but have they been supportive of the work you've done in general? Are, you know, is there a dialogue that you have with the government that is open and clear and uh, easy enough? Uh, yes, from Youth for Climate Argentina, we do have a dialogue with different areas of the government, be it the national Argentinian or some local uh, governments as well. But from that dialogue transforming into concrete climate action, um, it's very difficult. Argentina right now has a poverty rate close to 50%, an inflation rate close to 100% annually. Um, so basically the agenda is somewhere else. It's very hard to push through the message that it's impossible to solve poverty and achieve social justice without including uh, a climate perspective and concrete solutions to environmental issues. Um, and so in that sense, we have dialogue with some areas of the government. They're open many times to listen to what we have to say. We even have very decent environmental laws in Argentina, but it's an implementation where it becomes very difficult. Right. Uh, in terms of government penetration, it being able to actually implement those laws that it passes. And so that's a lot of what we've been working on in the last few years with Youth for Climate, is being able to develop local capabilities yeah. so that where the government doesn't reach, well, local organizations and NGOs and, and advocacy um, organizations like Youth for Climate can, well, help push that forward. Now, the uh, UAE is going to host COP28. Uh, what expectations do you have going into next year's COP, which is going to be where you live now, right? Yeah, so growing up in the UAE, um, I think in the past five to six years, um, the environment has become a really strong um, base and they've really involved the youth in that, I could say. The network that's found in the Arab Youth Council, for instance, for climate change, um, it has the potential to bring not just um, the capabilities, but the literacy to even speak about this, to even um, kind of indicate what sort of ways that we can help um, our impacted areas in the MENA region. Um, and that obviously involves Sudan. And I would love to know, you know how much um, our Sudanese youth are going to be part of that. Right. How much our um, ideas, our solutions, our research, um, also the idea of, because I come from a scientific background as well, I wanna know how we can transform the science into policy, how it can be strengthened in its communication because in the, it's honestly what we have to study in the next few years and what we have to study now for sure, but there are coming years of inhabitable conditions and our policies need to make sure that we are not doing anything to bring that closer to us. Now, it's, there are lots of people here who, who've been hearing from many, many different uh, 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 agenda and, and voices. If you were to leave them with one thing that they should remember, uh, what is it that you would like them to know? Just maybe one main thing. I would say, um, Kind of reflect in your human nature, why you're here today, the situation that you've come from, and then compare that with people that are facing this issue in a thousand times worse. People that are displaced by a situation that they didn't choose to be in that situation, they didn't even contribute to that situation. Compare yourself and then you will feel that responsibility because that's how I felt. I lived my whole life in the UAE. I didn't live in Sudan, but I did go to Sudan. And I had to shift to, to really see what's going on. And suddenly I'm so aware of that life that I'm not living and that life that I should have the responsibility to support. What about you, EL? We have seven years to reduce greenhouse emissions in 
That means we need to accelerate processes as much as possible. And we need to help young people and young organizations develop the capability to be able to help push forward those transformations. And in that sense, we need you to champion us. We need you to open doors. We need a mentorship. We need you to be able to present us with the right connections in order for us to do the rest of the work, because we know how to do it. We know how to pitch. We know how to develop initiatives. We can make a beautiful deck. We just need a little bit of help helping to make those connections that it's really difficult to get if you're young, if you're from the global south, in order for us to be able to accelerate those processes and help make the world for us and for you a slightly better place. And Kazi? For me, uh, the green economy is the only opportunity uh, that we have to survive. Uh, it's the opportunity to create jobs. Uh, it's the opportunity we have to make this world sustainable. So, and the green economy starts with uh, changing our mindset with what we consume, what we produce, what we use in our daily life. So uh, we have to, to consume, to produce, to use eco-friendly, to be responsible, and then so we will be achieving uh, that green economy, and then we'll be achieving climate actions, we'll be achieving that sustainable development we are planning for us and for the future. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your thoughts.